Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this is the last in a fantastic series on the Great Controversy. This is lesson number 13 for June 29 of 2024, entitled The Triumph of God's Love. Man, we should do that as quick as possible, right? That sounds like a great thing. <laughs> Anyway, we'd like to begin with the words of prayer. Our wonderful Father, we can't imagine how patient you've been with our bumbling and our carrying on, our sinfulness, our selfishness, and how frequently we've been led astray by the devil. But we know, and we're so thankful that in the end, your love will triumph. We celebrate that you know, with this lesson. May it be soon as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. So when will God's love triumph? Can you, could you give me a date, please, anybody? <laughs> well, Jim, I guess you have to read the, guide, the guidelines there. We can face the future with hope. Although challenging times are coming, whatever suffering we may go through, whatever hardships we may endure, whatever the sorrows we experience, if we have hope a better day is coming, we can live life until the purpose Let's okay. come to life with purpose and joy. Franklin D. Roosevelt was president during 40, 1843 to 1945, one of the most difficult periods of U.S. history. He was par paralyzed by polio and unable to walk up unaided. He once wrote, we have always held to the hope, the belief, the conviction that there is a better life, a better world beyond the horizon. Albert Einstein, one of the world's most brilliant men wrote, learn from yesterday, live for today, hope for tomorrow. Alfred Lord Tennyson, a popular English poet during Queen Victoria's reign, once wrote, hope smiles with the th from the th threshold of the years to come, whispering it will be happier, adult Bible study guide. Well, you can certainly hope that's going to be true. Jennifer? From the Bible Study Guide, this lesson wraps up our study, highlighting the final developments in the cosmic war between God and Satan. Among the notable events that transpire during the culmination of the great controversy are one, the time of trouble, two, the second coming of Jesus, three, the executive judgment in heaven during the millennium, with a synopsis of events both on earth and in heaven at that time, and four, the restoration of all things for eternity. I'm going to interrupt for just a second. I have a little bit of a problem with the wording here. Um, executive judgment. Executive means what does that mean? What does that word mean? Execute. Yeah, something yeah. happens. <laughs> something happens. So we have tended to call the judgment. They're talking about executive here. Uh, well, I, there are actually five judgments, and I'm going to talk about them very quickly. The first one is the investigative judgment that's going on right now in heaven. Then there's an executive judgment that happens at the second coming when the righteous will be taken to heaven and the wicked will be left here dead. Then there's another investigative judgment. That's the one they're talking about here that happens during the millennium when ever, all of us here who haven't been able to been, been able to see the records from heaven, we see why God chose the way he did. And then there's going to be another um, executive judgment, and that will be at the third coming when the wicked will perish and the righteous so forth. But then even beyond that, there will be the final result when God remakes everything and the righteous get what they have been waiting for thousands of years for. So uh, I, I think they've slightly misjudged, but that's okay. Go ahead. <laughs> The Bible promises that the great controversy will end in God's victory. Scripture calls us to trust God, participate with Him in the salvation of as many souls as possible, and share in His past, the cross, present, individual, church, and salvation, and future, the final cosmic victory. Yay. Amen. For those who know what is coming and have properly prepared themselves, we can say, the time of trouble is a great time to be alive, quoting Dr. Richard Neese. The time of trouble happens about after the close of probation. That's important to know. 
a time of trouble happens after the close of probation. And the close of probation, as we will see, happens after each person has made up his or her mind as to which side she or he is going, to which side she's going to commit. Dwayne? Revelation 22, 11 and 12. Whoever is evil must go on do doing evil, and whoever is filthy must go on being filthy. Whoever is good must go on doing good, and whoever is holy must go on being holy. Listen, says Jesus, I am coming soon. I will bring my rewards with me to give to each one according to what he has done. Okay, very good from our, Bible, our American Bible Society, Good News Translation. The Bible, even in the Old Testament, makes it very clear that the faithful will be those whose names God has already written in his book. Daniel 12 talks about that and Jeremiah 30. So what does that tell us about God's foreknowledge? It better be accurate, right? <laughs> it is. I know there's a question about that. Revelation 16 describes the seven last plagues. To the wicked, it would be a time of awful, awful destruction. But to the faithful, it would be a time of God's protection. And let's just talk about that for a moment. In that final battle, Satan has one goal, to destroy, if possible, either to, to convert people to his side or to destroy them. He would like to eliminate all of God's people from this earth and just say to God, okay, you can have the rest of the universe, but this world is mine. Of course, he will not be able to do that. And we know that God says, Satan, you can pour whatever plagues you want on the world. There's only one group that you can't touch. Those are my people. That's exactly the people that Satan wants to touch. And so we've got this terrible conflict in that situation. But to the faithful, it will be a time of, of God's protection. Their names will have been written in the Book of Life. I see Philippians 4, 3, and Revelation 13, 8, and Revelation 20, 12, and 15. Revelation 22, 19. Jesus himself gave us numerous promises that he would be with us and that he is preparing a place for us in heaven. Back to a famous verse, famous passage, Myra. Yes, 1 John 3, 1 to 3. See how much the Father has loved us. His love is so great that we are called God's children. And so, in fact, we are. This is why the world does not know us. It, is, it has not known God. Dear friends, we are now God's children, but it is not yet clear what shall we shall become. But we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him because we shall see him as he really is. Everyone who has, who has this hope in Christ keeps himself pure, just as Christ is pure. Good News Bible. Okay, Gordon, you want to jump in there the bible study guide in the time of trouble god's people have a personal relationship with jesus so deep that nothing can change it their consummate desire is to please him in all things so that through the work of the holy spirit they will be as pure as he is pure will that ever happen wow i don't think that's that's the goal really going to happen but a goal okay there was nothing in Christ's heart that responded to Satan's deceptions. We can reflect this aspect of his character as well. From the Bible Study Guide for Sunday. Okay. There are numerous passages in Scripture which tell us that Jesus will always be with us if we remain faithful to him. Psalms 27, Psalm 91, Revelation 3. And our Bible study guide goes on. There are some who have misunderstood the concept of living through the time of trouble without a mediator. Jesus ceases his mediation in heaven's sanctuary when everyone has made their final decision for or against him. So if you've already made your final decision, what does that mean? If it's your you've final already decision, de probation is closed. <laughs> you've already decided. You've closed but, your probation. Yeah, this does not mean that we are alone during this time. Trusting our own strength, Jesus has assured us he will be with us always. Matthew 28, 20. Faith trusts when it cannot see and believes even when the world around us is falling apart. During the time of trouble, our faith strengthens 
and our longing for eternity increases so that our one, one desire is to live forever with Jesus from our Bible study guide for Sunday. So you said Satan wants to convert uh, he, he, he would love to convert everybody to his side. Does he not realize that probation is closed? And the well, I don't know whether he has a... He must have a pretty good idea when probation is closed. And that's, of course, when God says, okay, Satan, do whatever you want. And he will start... He will, he, Satan, who's the one who's going to cause the seven last plagues. And that's what happens at that point in time. And his goal, Satan's goal in the seven last plagues is to destroy God's people, and they're the only people that he can't touch. So it's In the a, process, he destroys a whole a lot, lot of other people, people, yeah. Which he doesn't care about his people anyway. Hmm. One word stands out as being absolutely essential for God's faithful people during the time of trouble. That word is hope. We have God's promises, and we need to maintain our hope in him. And what happens to those people who do not have hope? Look at the contrast between those who have hope and those who do not. Jim? Revelation chapter 6, verses 15 to 17. Then the kings of the earth, the rulers of the military chiefs, and rich and the powerful, and all other people, slave and free, hid themselves in caves and under rocks on the mountains. They called out to the mountains and to the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the eyes of the one who sits on the throne and from the anger of the Lamb. The terrible day of their anger is here, and who can stand against it? Wow. Okay, the contrast. Isaiah chapter 25, <clears throat> verses 8 to 9. The sovereign Lord will destroy death forever. He will wipe away the tears from everyone's eyes and take away the disgrace his people have suffered throughout the world. The Lord himself has spoken. When it happens, everyone will say, He is our God. We have put our trust in him and he has rescued us. He is the Lord. We have put our trust in him and now we are happy and joyful because he has saved us. What a contrast. Are you going to be hiding in the caves asking for the rocks to fall on you? Are you going to be saying, Hallelujah, Jesus has come? Mm. To the righteous, the second coming of Jesus will be a time to celebrate the wedding feast of the Lamb. They will be singing praises to God. And that's all in Revelation 15, 3 to 4. Dwayne? From the writings of Ellen White, <clears throat> the cross of Christ will be the science and the song of the redeemed through all eternity. In Christ glorified, they will behold Christ crucified, that the maker of all worlds, the arbiter of all destinies, should lay aside his glory and humiliate himself from love to man will ever excite the wonder and adoration of the universe. Okay, now I'm going to notice it said, what will we be studying for the rest of eternity? The science and song of the redeemed. The cross of Christ will be the science and song of the redeemed. There are a lot of people who believe that when we're, we suddenly are transported to heaven, we're not going to remember anything. It's just going to be glory up there. We won't have any idea about anything that was past. Well, look at this next passage. Myra? From the Bible Commentary, Ellen G. White. The plan of salvation, making manifest the justice and love of God, provides an eternal safeguard against... How long is it going to last? Eternally. Okay. Safeguard against defection in unfallen worlds, against defection in unfallen worlds, as well as among those who shall be redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Let me interrupt for a second again. So what are we saying here? The plan of salvation impacts the entire universe. It's not just for us. That's something that very few people seem to have grasped. Okay? Yeah, against the defection yep. in unfallen worlds. Our only hope is perfect trust in the blood of him who can save the uttermost all, save to the uttermost all that come to God by him. The death of Christ on the cross of Calvary is our only hope in this world and will be our theme in the world to come. Okay, so 
what are we going to be doing? We're going to be talking about the wonders of salvation for the rest of eternity. It's not going to be forgotten. It doesn't mean we're going to talk about all the terrible things that happen. And I don't know how God's going to sort that out. But um, Some people have suggested that when we get into talking about things and we talk about this and then we talk about, that, about the bad parts, God will say, we don't need to talk about those. Just talk about the good stuff. I don't know. That's a possibility. But apparently the bad things will fade into, yeah. into not That's, being very meaningful in relation yeah. to all the good things that we yeah. all have. Revelation 13, portraying Satan's side in the great controversy, seems to suggest that the whole world will wander after him, even worship him. Can you imagine that? God's response as recorded in Revelation 14 will lead to the close of probation and the plagues described in Revelation really 15 and 16, but especially 16. So is the world becoming more, here's, here's the question, is the world becoming more loving, following God's example, or more selfish and self-centered, following Satan's example? Let's see, can we guess? Hmm. Just look around us. <laughs> yeah. Just look around, around us. At the, wow. Look, listen to the news, watch the news, yeah. read the news. And then the end will come. Revelation 19, 11 through 16 says, Then I saw heaven open, and there was a white horse. Its rider is called Faithful and True. It is with justice that he judges and fights his battles. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and he wore many crowns on his head. He had a name written on him, but no one except himself knows what it is. The robe he wore was covered with blood. His name is, quote, the word of God, end quote. The armies of heaven followed him, riding on white horses and dressed in clean white linen. Out of his mouth came a sharp sword with which he will defeat the nations. I'm, I'm going to interrupt there for again. What does it mean a sharp sword comes out of his mouth? His, what comes out of his mouth? Words. His words. His words, exactly. His words will be very decisive. Yeah. Well, it's, it's his words compared to all the other stuff that have been yeah. down through the generations, and, and it gives you something to, to, to make a division on it, a judgment. It's called a judgment or a separation. Yeah. Continuing in verse, yeah. Continuing in verse 15, he will rule over them with a rod of iron, and he will trample out out the wine in the uh, wine press of the furious anger of the Almighty God. On his robe and on his thigh was written the name King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Good News Bible. Okay. Revelation 20, verses <coughs> 1 to 3. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding in his hand the key of the abyss and a heavy chain. <clears throat> he seized the dragon, that ancient serpent, that is the devil or Satan, and chained him up for a thousand years. The angel threw him into the abyss, locked it, and sealed it so that he could not deceive the nations any more until the thousand years were over. And after that, he must be let loose for a little while. And I would just tell you that if you don't have an understanding of the great controversy, this is, ju this is just completely impossible to understand. The being let loose for a while? Well... I mean, th th start out with the, with the chaining him up and locking him. So why, you know, if Satan's the cause of all the problem, why, and God can, just lock him up, what's he waiting for? Why hasn't he locked him up a long time ago? Freedom. Well? It's a figurative locking up because there's no one there to, for him to tempt. All which is fine, but, you know, the question is, why didn't he do it right after Adam and Eve sinned? Freedom. Love. Okay. Yeah. And then, of course, the real clincher is, and after a thousand years, you're going to let him loose again? I mean, who in their right mind would do that? Unless, of course, you know about the great controversy and love and freedom and all those good things. Okay, go ahead. Did you, did you finish yours? I guess so. If you do not have an understanding of the great controversy and the accusations and challenges that the devil has leveled against God, then Revelation 20, 1 through 3 and 7, which we didn't read, we'll, we'll a little bit later, are impossible to understand. Even scholars are completely puzzled. 
I can tell you one very famous Revelation scholar said, I think John must have left his final notes for Revelation scattered on his desk when he died. And some unknowing assistant put them together in a mixed up order. And that's why we have it this way. I mean, serious. This is one of the world famous top Revelation scholars. Yeah. Because he can't explain it. Because he doesn't understand anything about the great controversy. His paradigm, it doesn't fit his paradigm. Exactly. The image in Revelation 20, 1 through 3 is symbolic. Satan is not literally bound with a chain and locked in a pit. For 1,000 years he is confined to this desolate, depopulated earth, bound by the circumstances he himself has created. Doesn't he love to hear that? In 2 Peter 2, 4, we read that Satan and his angels were reserved for punishment by chains of darkness. Satan will be confined to the earth by a chain of circumstances which no one, with no one to tempt. For a thousand years he will see the devastation, destruction, and disaster that his rebellion has created. The Greek word translated bottomless pit is the same word from which we get our English word abyss. It also is the same word used in the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament, to describe the earth at creation. Quote, the earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. That's the abyss. In the Septuagint, the word deep here is the Greek word abusos, or abyss. It describes a desolate earth. The bottomless pit is not some subterranean cavern or some yawning chasm somewhere out there in the universe. Satan's work of sin and destruction, along with the tremendous chaos preceding the second coming, has brought the earth back to a dark, disorganized mass, like its condition at the beginning of creation, from our Bible study guide for Tuesday. Okay, Jim? Genesis chapter 1, verse 2. The earth was formless and desolate, abusos. The raging ocean that covered everything was engulfed in dark total darkness, and the Spirit of God was moving over the water. Okay, and then Jeremiah 4, Jennifer? Jeremiah 4, verses 23 to 26. I looked at the earth, it was a barren waste. At the sky, there was no light. I looked at the mountains, they were shaking, and the hills were rocking to and fro. I saw that there were no people, even the birds had flown away. The fertile land had become a desert. Its cities were in ruins because of the Lord's fierce anger. Wow. That doesn't sound too s promising, too good, does it? Dwayne? Jeremiah twenty-five thirty-three. On that day, the bodies of those whom the Lord has killed will lie scattered from one end of the earth to the other. No one will mourn for them, and they will not be taken away and buried. They will lie on the ground like piles of manure. Wow. And what is that supposed to remind you of? Mm. The garbage pit right outside of the wall at Jerusalem. Remember that if, if you, if you uh, lived in those times and there's no one and you died and nobody, none of your family, no family, relatives, friends was willing to take care of you, that's what happened to you. You got chucked, your body got chucked in the garbage pit. It's called Gehenna. Gehenna. That's right. Well, that will be the end of all those who persistently refuse God's plan for their lives. Okay, where are we? I'm here. Myra. The Bible study guide for Tuesday, June 25 says, the prophet here emphasizes the catastrophic destruction at the second coming of Christ and that no person will be left alive on earth during this thousand year period. Satan and his evil angels are left to contemplate the havoc caused by his rebellion. Okay, I'm gonna interrupt Only again. Imagine can, what that will can, be. Yeah, exactly. Imagine what that's gonna be like a thousand years to point fingers at each other and yeah, do you wonder what what the earth is going to look like during that time it's wow. darkness. The entire universe recognizes anew the wages of sin is death, Romans 6.23. God deals with sins, the sin problem, so that it will never rise again, Nehemiah 1.9. Nahum. Nahum, I'm sorry. 
There are three prime ways God does this. First, he reveals his limitless love, passionate desire, and relentless efforts to save all humanity. Second, he reveals his justice, fairness, and righteousness. Third, he allows the universe to see the ultimate results of sin and rebellion. Wow. There it is, spelled Nahum, out for you. Nahum 1 9 says, What are you plotting against the Lord? He will destroy you. No one opposes him more than once. <laughs> that's, that's pretty Good blunt, isn't it? Yeah. Just after the second coming, the millennium will start. Revelation 20, for it, here's where. Now, it's interesting to notice that in the Old Testament, no one knows anything about Christ coming except the first time. Now, we know that there's a few verses in the Old Testament that apply on to the second coming and so forth. They didn't know that. So they thought that Christ was only going to come one time. You go to the New Testament, and you go up, to, and you cut off at Revelation 20, and you everything up to Revelation 20, those people, even Paul and Peter and all those people, believed that there was just going to be a second coming. There's never going to be anything beyond a second coming. Only John, who lived way beyond any of the others, got this revelation in Revelation 20, 21 and 22, that there was going to be a millennium. It's going to be a surprise to Paul and to Peter and to all those people. So let's read about it. Mm -hmm. Then I saw thrones, and those who sat on them were given the power to judge. I also saw the souls of those who had been executed because they had proclaimed the truth that Jesus revealed in the Word of God. They had not worshipped the beast or its image, nor had they received the mark on the, of the beast on their foreheads or their hands. They came to life and ruled as kings with Christ for a thousand years. So what group is that? We have a code name for them. The saved. The well, sure, the 144,000. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were over. This is the first raising of the dead. Happy and greatly blessed are those who are included in the first raising of the dead. The second death has no power over them. They shall be priests of God and of Christ, and they will rule with him for a thousand years. Okay, Jim, the Bible study guide there. During the millennium, the righteous will have opportunity to observe firsthand God's justice and love and how he has dealt with the sin problem. Who doesn't have... Who doesn't have questions? They would like to ask God about a lot of things. Now, during the millennium in heaven, the redeemed get to ask these, those questions. If loved ones or close friends are absent from, the hev from heaven, the saved have the opportunity to understand God's decision more fully in a new way, more forcefully than ever before. The redeemed will grasp God's powerful attempt to save every person who has ever lived. They will realize anew that everyone who is lost has missed out on heaven because of their own personal rejection of Christ. Only then does God bring final judgment, the second death, which is eternal destruction on the lost. Okay, now, I don't know if I put it in here or not, but... We have a passage, which is coming up anyway, that says if God took the wicked to heaven, it would be torture for them. So, okay, Jennifer, 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians 5.10, For all of us must appear before Christ to be judged by him. We will each receive what we deserve according to everything we have done, good or bad, in our bodily life. Why don't you go ahead and do Romans there as well. Okay, Romans 14, verses 10 through 12. You then, who eat only vegetables, why do you pass judgment on others? And you, who eat anything, why do you despise other believers? All of us will stand before God to be judged by Him. For the scripture says, quote, As surely as I am the living God, says the Lord, everyone will kneel before me, and everyone will confess that I am God. Every one of us, then, will have to give an account of ourselves to God. And you need to understand the context here. This whole chapter, Revelation, I'm sorry, Romans 14, is about whether or not you should be allowed to eat food which has been offered to idols. 
This has nothing to do with health. This is not about cholesterol or any of that kind of stuff. It's about whether or not you can go to the market and buy a piece of meat that has been sacrificed to some idol on its way into the market. And the very conservative people felt if that meat has been offered to idols, it's not safe for you to eat it. Because, Others, hmm? because if you eat it, you're supposedly worshiping, worshiping that, that idol. That idol. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. But others said, that God can't possibly do anything to that meat. It's, it's, it's a question, there. whether or not you should eat is a, a separate question, but as far as the rules, uh, okay, Revelation 20. Dwayne? Then I saw a great white throne and the one who sits on it. Earth and heaven fled from his presence and were seen no more. And I saw the dead, great and small alike, standing before the throne. Books were opened, and then another book was opened, the book of the living. The dead were judged according to what they had done, as recorded in the books. Then the sea gave up its dead. Death and the world of the dead also gave up the dead they held, and all were judged according to what they had done. Then death and the world of the dead were thrown into the lake of fire. This lake of fire is the second death. Whoever did not have their names written in the book of the living were thrown into the lake of fire. Okay. Following the thousand years known as the millennium, millennium, of course, the word means thousand years, what will happen? Myra? The Bible study guide says, For a thousand years Satan has had no one to tempt or deceive. He's wow. been thinking of lots of things. <laughs> And he and his angels have been alone to reflect on the deadly consequences of sin. See Great Controversy, page 659, paragraph 1. At the end of the millennium, the wicked dead are resurrected to face the judgment and to receive their final reward. I'm not sure about a reward, but... Well, you remember that it says in, in, in yeah. Second Corinthians, first, first Corinthians, we're going to judge angels. That's what we're talking about here. Okay. We'll judge the evil angels. Yeah. yeah. Revelation 25, in parentheses, the rest of the dead did not come to life until a thousand years were over, from the Good News Bible. And the go. Bible study guide, go ahead. No, go ahead. Bible study guide says, now Satan has a vast army of followers. That is after they come to life at the, at the end of the millennium. Mm-hmm. Although Satan has suffered defeat after defeat in the great controversy, <clears throat> he is encouraged as he sees the huge throng of the lost. Not yet ready to end his rebellion, he goes out to deceive these nations. Satan inspires them to make one last great effort to overthrow God and set up their own kingdom. The term Gog and Magog is used to symbolize Satan and the unsaved of all ages. Satan and his followers surround the camp of the saints and the beloved city. And what is their goal? To take over, to get to the Get tree into of life. the tree of life. Get to the tree of life. That's what they want to do. Okay, Revelation 27 to 9. After the thousand years are over, Satan and his angels will be let loose from his prison. And he will go out to deceive the nations scattered over the whole world. That is Gog and Magog. Satan will bring them all together for battle, as many as the grains of sand on the seashore. They spread out over the earth and the stirred, and I'm sorry, and surrounded the camp of God's people and the city that he loves. But fire came down from heaven and destroyed them. Now, if we had time to go through all the details, you know that Jesus Christ is raised up high above the city of the, the Holy, the New Jerusalem, and he is crowned. And everybody who's ever lived will see that. The righteous from inside the city and the wicked from outside the city. And then after Jesus is crowned, crowned God's glory will begin to pour out over the, the surface of the world. And we know from a couple of places in Desire of Ages particularly, and some other places, that what, what happens when the glory of God hits the righteous? gives them eternal life. And what happens when it gets, hits the wicked? They're gone. They're gone. 
Okay. Um, Jim, I guess you've got the next one there. Bible study guide. At the close of the millennium, not only are all the wicked raised to life, but the holy city, New Jerusalem, descends to earth from heaven. Revelation 21, verse 2. The saints have been living and reigning with Christ in the New Jerusalem for a millennium. Now, at the end of the thousand years, the city descends to earth along with, G with God, Jesus, and the angels. And all the redeemed, everyone is pre pre present for the final ba battle of the great controversy. Sin is about to be eradicated once and for all from the Bible study guide. Okay, Jennifer, 21, Revelation 21. Revelation 21, verse 2. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared and ready, like a bride dressed to meet her husband. In the end, every being, even Satan, will acknowledge that God has been fair. And where do we read that in the Bible? Philippians, Philippians 2. 2. Philippians 2, what? Philippians 2, Yeah. I okay, Dwayne? The Bible study guide there? Yes. To resolve the sin problem so evil never arises again, everyone must be convinced that God has been fair and just in all his ways. Ultimately, every knee shall bow and acknowledge God's justice in the great controversy. And there's the Philippians passage right there. Even Satan and his evil angels, and that there was never any justification for rebellion against God. Right. Let us read what Ellen White has to say on this topic. Myra? Yeah, this is from The Great Controversy. This is amazing, this passage. Go ahead. As soon as the books of, the, of record were opened, the eye of Jesus looks upon the wicked. They are conscious of every sin which they have ever committed. Wow. They see just where their feet diverge from the path of purity and holiness, just how far pride and rebellion have carried them in the violation of God's law. The seductive temptations which they encouraged by indulgence in sin, indulgence in sin, the blessings perverted and the messengers of God despised, the warnings rejected, the waves of mercy beaten back by the stubborn, unrepentant heart, all appear as if written in letters of fire. The whole wicked world stand arraigned in the bar of God on the charge of high treason against the government of heaven. They have none to plead their case. They are without excuse. The sentence of eternal death is pronounced against them. Yeah. Notice the very interesting passage. Where does that come from? Great controversy page. Six, six, six. Six, six, six. <laughs> I don't know how it came out like that, but it's appropriate, I guess. Okay, here's the passage I mentioned earlier. Another Gordon? passage from Great Controversy 542. A life of rebellion against God has unfitted them, that is the wicked, <clears throat> for heaven. Its purity, holiness, and peace would be torture to them. The glory of God would be a consuming fire. They would long to flee from that holy place. They would welcome destruction that they might be hidden from the face of him who died to redeem them. The destiny of the wicked is fixed by their own choice, not by God's choice, yeah. their own choice. Their exclusion from heaven is voluntary with themselves and just and merciful on the part of God. Okay, so God will not torture <coughs> anyone, either in heaven or in so-called hell. I mean, if God took them to heaven, it would be torture for them there. So there's no other option. Malachi 4, 1 and 2, The Lord Almighty says, The day is coming when all proud and evil people will burn like straw, on that day they will burn up and there will be nothing left of them. But for you who obey me, my saving power will rise on you like the sun and bring healing like the sun's rays. You will be as free and happy as calves let out of the stall from the Good News Bible. It is important to notice that it is the memory of the lost that will be eternally destroyed. There will be no eternal torture. In the Bible, the terms forever or eternal or everlasting simply mean 
as long as it is supposed to last. And Exodus 21, 6, you'll notice that it says a person could choose to serve his master forever if you go to the King James Version. And how long can he serve his master? No longer than his life lasts, right? Mm -hmm. First Samuel 22 and so forth. So, uh, in the end, one of the two eternities await us all. The lost, unfortunately, receive the wages they have earned. Eternal death, Romans 6.23. Why, then, is our only hope of not getting what we deserve, which is death found in trusting in Jesus' right, Jesus' righteousness? <clears throat> Bible study guide for Thursday. And when all sin, sinners, evil, death, and sickness are gone, what will be, what will be left? Jim? There the widespread plains swell into hills of beauty, and the mountains of God rear their lofty summits. On those peaceful plains, beside those living streams, God's people, so long pilgrims and wanderers, shall find a home. Wow. Great controversy, 675. Their mortal minds will contemplate with never failing delight the wonders of the creative of creative power the mysteries of redeeming love there will be no cruel deceiving foe to tempt to forgetfulness of god every faculty will be developed every capacity increased the acquirement of knowledge will not weary the mind or exhaust the energies there the great grandest enterprise may be carried forward the loftiest aspirations reached and the highest ambitions realized. And still there will arise new heights to surmount, new wonders to admire, new truths to comprehend, fresh objects to call forth the power of mind and soul and body. Let me interrupt there. <clears throat> Dr. Richard Neese, one of my mentors, looks at this and he, he says, that's completely wrong. The English is wrong. How can you beat the highest and the greatest and, so and still there's more? But that's the way it will be. You get, and my wife understands it perfectly well because many times she's following me up climbing mountains and you get to where he thinks, oh, I guess that wasn't the top. Now there's another one beyond that one. And then you get to that, oh, there's another one beyond that one. So we understand that. Okay, go ahead. With unutterable delight, the children of earth enter into the joy and wisdom of unfallen beings. They share the treasures of knowledge and understanding gained through ages upon ages in contemplation of God's handiwork. With undimmed vision, they gaze upon the glory of the creation, sun and stars and systems, all in their appointed order, circling the throne of deity upon all things, from the least to the greatest. The greater name is written, and in all, excuse me, and in all are the riches of his power displayed. Ellen White, Great wow. University, page 677 mm. and 8. Jennifer? From Ellen G. White, the great controversy is ended. Sin and sinners are no more. The entire universe is clean. One pulse of harmony and gladness beats Amen. through the vast creation. From him who created all flow life and light and gladness throughout the realms of illimitable space. From the minutest atom to the greatest world, all things, animate and inanimate, in their unshadowed beauty and perfect joy, declare that God is love. And that, of course, is the end of the book, Great Controversy. Fabulous. I mean, man, what could you ask for more than that? I wonder if the whole universe isn't just going to yeah. breathe a big sigh. Yeah, celebrate. Of relief and gladness. You know, I, my wife and I were discussing this yesterday. We, we listen to choir, big choirs, and they're singing four parts, and it's marvelous. We're going to be, and you know, you know we, can, we can actually hear, what is it, five or six octaves? And we can see one octave. Yeah. Imagine what's going to happen when we get to heaven. I'm sure our vision is going to expand where we can see all the way from x-rays to who knows what at the other end. 
and our hearing is going to go from the very low pitch that we can't even imagine now to the highest possible imagine and then we're going to have a choirs that are going to sing maybe 20 parts can you imagine a 200 person choir singing 20 parts whoa okay we can dream we can okay okay well who's next i think Dwayne, is it yours? <clears throat> Bible study guide. Why do you think God has allowed sin to go on for so long? At the same time, no human being suffers in this world longer than their own existence here. That is, no one suffers more than his or her own lifetime. How short is a human lifetime compared to the thousands of years of sin? How might this perspective help us deal with the difficult question of evil? How does the thousand-year period known as the millennium fit into the plan of salvation? Think about what it says about the character of God that not until all of the redeemed will have had a chance to see the justice and fairness and love of God, not until then will final judgment be brought upon the lost. Okay, and even the lost, all the lost will have said, remember we read earlier that as soon as the, the panorama is shown as Christ is crowned and the panorama breaks loose. Everybody will see the entire history of the great controversy and they will see everything they have done and how they have related to it. And every one of the people, you know, we've, we already read that in that, in that setting, they will, the wicked will say, I made all the wrong choices. There's no, there's no question about it. I, I don't even want to go there. It would be torture for me to go to heaven. So every, when the third, at the end of the third coming, when God recreates our earth, we can be certain that every being in the entire universe says, God, you did everything you could do. You've been fair and honest and, and just for everybody. Even the wicked will say that as they perish. Well, what should we have learned from this lesson? Well, from the Bible study guide, it says, God himself will sustain and protect his people during the most brutal parts of the final battle of the great controversy. Thank goodness. The great controversy will end with God's victory over the devil, over evil and sin, and over suffering and death. This threefold victory is assured because it is already, it has already been secured by Christ through his death and resurrection. We share in God's victory when we accept it by faith and allow the Holy Spirit to work it out in us. God's victory <clears throat> will culminate in the second coming of Jesus, in the millennial judgment, and in the restoration of all things. Amen. Well, what do we know about the close of probation? From the Bible study guide, it says, the close of probation is a topic that often induces fear in many people. Probation closes for each individual at his or her death. That is, the window of opportunity for an individual to respond to God's grace has been closed by his death, has been closed by death. His or her attitude toward God's revealed grace will have eternal consequences. God is righteous and will treat each individual's case according to the light that he or she received but our individual response decisively matters. However, Adventists understand from scripture that apart from the closing of probation at one's death, there will be a moment in the history of the great controversy when God will declare that the time when people can accept his forgiving grace <clears throat> in order to be saved has ended. Does God do that or does each okay, person? Okay, so if you read all the details here from Ellen White, she says, an angel will bring back a report from the earth saying everybody has made their decision. Yeah. And Jesus says, okay, there's no reason for us to wait any longer. Continuing with the Bible study guide, that moment will be the point of no return and no one will be saved beyond that time. They won't choose to be saved beyond yeah. that time. No. The world will, They've already chosen. The world then will live under the pronouncement uh, recorded in the book of Revelation, quote, let the, let the one who does wrong still do wrong, and the one who is filthy still be filthy. 
Let the one who is righteous still practice righteousness, and the one who is holy still keep himself holy. That's from Revelation 22, 11, New American Standard Bible. Truly concerned for their salvation, many Christians and Adventists ask such questions as, what if the moment of the close of probation will catch me off guard or unaware? What if I will not be completely ready at that moment? At least two clarifications are necessary here. First, the close of probation is real and it will take place. The deceptions, intrigues, and evils of the devil will not continue forever. Sin, suffering, and death will not hold sway eternally. To eternalize the devil, evil, and death would mean that God is not a God of love and righteousness. But because he is, he will put an end to the sources and forces of evil. God has patiently waited and given every opportunity to humans to test his promises, to come to know him and return to him and to his kingdom of grace. How much God would have loved for all humanity to accept his gospel, but there, would be, there, but there will be a moment when God will say, enough, it is finished. And why will he say that? Let's be clear. Their decision. People have made their choice. They've, even, they've either chosen selfishness or they've chosen love. Let's just be clear. That's what it's about. Are, do we want to live in a world where, where we continue to live selfishly or do we want to live in a world where people are loving? That's, that's where it's going to end. Second, God will not withdraw his gift of sustaining grace from the people from his people, despite his withdrawal of mercy and forgiving grace to the unrepentant at the close of probation. This point is very important. The end of probation does not imply that God's love and grace for humanity have reached their limits or that they have been consumed. God never ceases to be the God of love, grace, and righteousness portrayed in the Bible. For this reason, there will be no one after probation closes who will have sincerely wanted to record to receive God's grace and who would have responded with faith to God's mercy to whom God would say, sorry, too late. I would love to have saved you, but the grace period is ended. And why is that not possible? Because everyone will have made a decision for okay, themselves. Okay, but there's Act another part. Passively. Yeah, another part of that, of course, God knows the future. So even if he left them, let them continue to go on, if God knows that sometime later they would have been done right, he would have made that arrangement in time for, for, the, for the judgment to take place. God's closure of probation will be his confirmation that every individual has made his or her final decision about his grace and his kingdom. At a future moment in history, the historical setting of the world will be such that all the inhabitants of the earth will make this final decision and will side with either God or Satan. However, that decision will not be made in the impulse of the moment. Rather, each person's decision for eternity will be made, will be made based on his or her free choice and in full consciousness of its consequences. This is not a one-time, whoop, I guess I choose right now, this way, no. This is based on all the choices we have made to the years of our lives. Just as Northern Israel and Judah, when they rejected God's covenant and Messiah, some will decide they do not want to be with the God of the Bible. Others will agree with the Lucifer's, with uh, Lucifer's lie that they are gods and immoral. Uh, they do not, and immortal, I'm sorry, correct. Uh, they do not re, uh, relish the idea of being with God in his, in his kingdom. God is saddened by, those, by these unalterable decisions. He provided all the evidence and love necessary to save them, but he will respect their final choice. And what do you call that, Jim? Freedom. Freedom. This is your chance to the say choose, The choosing is the... Is, yeah. With, without freedom, there well, is no love. Well, that's what, when it says final choice, it's choosing, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. Others, however, decide to accept God's grace because they love him and want to stay with him forever. Uh, could you go ahead and do that, Jim, on another note? On another note, uh oh, I pulled. On another note, the close of probation does not imply that after moment, excuse me. After that moment. After that moment, God's faithful people will stand 
without his presence and grace and covering righteousness. Christ assured us that he will be with us always to the end of the age, Matthew 28, 12, or 28 verses, verse 20 from the New American Standard Bible. The empowerment of the Holy Spirit, which we will receive in order to give the loud cry will not be removed from us, all God's people, from Adam and Abel, Abel to Abraham and Moses, from David and, the, and the Isaiah to Paul and the last Christians sealed before the probation, will be saved exclusively by Christ's righteousness and mediation through faith. Thus, the idea that some Christians are, at the end of time will stand on their own merit and power is not biblical from the Bible study guide. Absolutely. So what does the Bible tell us about the new heaven and the new earth? Jennifer? In the Bible study guide, Christians generally talk and sing about heaven as the place of their final destination and eternal rest. However, we must maintain the biblical understanding of heaven and guard against falling into pagan or philosophical views on paradise. According to many worldviews, such as Greek, Hindu, or Buddhist philosophies, heaven is an alleged transcendent, timeless, and spaceless sphere that only a disembodied human mind or soul could reach. In Greek philosophy, the human mind that reaches heaven somehow keeps its identity and consciousness. In Hinduism, Buddhism, and Neoplatonism, the human consciousness that reaches heaven must disappear by dissolving into the universal consciousness. And then you get recycled. <laughs> okay, go ahead. As a result of the influence of classical Greek philosophy on traditional Christianity, most Christians now believe in the immortality of the soul and in a spiritual as opposed to a material heaven. These Christians do not realize that these philosophical concepts create irreconcilable contradictions in their theology and lives. On the one hand, when thinking about death and heaven, traditional Christians think in Greek philosophical terms. And Jennifer, we're going to need to close there. It's just about, we're just about running out of time. I hope you've gotten some picture of the, the fact that God's grace never ends. He reaches out forever, but those who continually reject Him and make choices every day to practice selfishness following the Satan's example, they will reap the final results. And we know what the final, those final results are. There's no question about it. You read well against, job, against God, and that will be the end. Let's pray. Our kind and loving Father, what a privilege we have of knowing all this de these details in advance so that we need not be taken by surprise. But Lord, help us not to be foolish enough to follow after Satan's ways and thus be destroyed with him is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.